I'm not making this up. My dad broke his leg weeding kudzu. He really did. Uh, so, so I'm 31 years old, and my generation is inheriting uh, a crowded planet that is having climate change. We have genocide. We have nuclear proliferation. We have cancer. We have all kinds of disease and apathy, depression. <clears throat> and <clears throat> I don't personally believe that the cleverness of the human mind is going to magically solve these problems in any kind of short timeline. But what I do believe is that there are opportunities that are kind of hidden inside of each of these challenges, kind of like seeds that are smuggled into a landfill, you know, just waiting there to sprout and regrow old ideas in the new conditions that we live in today. So take, for example, kudzu. Do any of you know what kudzu is? Okay, you know what kudzu is. All right, good. So in the southeastern U.S., there are over 7 million acres of kudzu. Um, and it came in in the 1920s from Japan. It was brought in actually to control erosion on steep slopes where we had denuded the slopes with, with um, logging or building, building roads. Kudzu was brought in to cover those slopes and prevent erosion, which it does really well. It was also brought in for fodder for animals because it's actually better fodder than alfalfa, higher protein for cows and sheep and goats and everything. And since then, it has become kind of a poster child for invasive exotic plant species. You know, you've seen it. It climbs up over trees and kills trees. It climbs up over houses. I found a banjo song online where it's about um, kudzu taking over people's brains, actually. Um, and eating them, which is pretty funny, and their cars, which it does. There are lots of great pictures of that. You can drive around, especially down in Georgia, Alabama, places like that, see kudzu um, eating cars. And so when my family moved to Western North Carolina um, in 1983, we bought three acres of steep south-facing kudzu with a dilapidated old house on it for $12,000 because it was very undesirable land. Um, and I grew up kind of playing in the kudzu, making tunnel forts underneath the kudzu, while other kids were probably, you know, playing in tree forts and stuff. And my dad would build all these machines out of old lawnmower uh, blades and washing machines that would grind kudzu vines down. Oh, hey. Wow. We've been planning that. It went off just right. Um, my dad would make all these machines that would, gr uh, out of old used parts, it would grind kudzu down and, and pack it into logs so we could burn it in our wood stove and things. And um, kudzu, it turns out, is a really useful plant. It's a, it's a nitrogen fixer. What that means is it pulls nitrogen out of the air. That's the main nutrient plants need to grow, puts it into the soil. Its huge roots break up the rocks in the soil and create this very loose texture that other things can grow in. It's actually kind of preparing the way for other things to grow. Uh, and so what I've begun doing at my dad's place is converting this three acres of south-facing kudzu to a food forest. And what, th what that means, in the winter, we're digging out the kudzu roots. These kudzu roots, some of them are 35 pounds, as big as half of my body. And they're full of the starch, which is actually an ancient food source in Japan. There's an entire cuisine around kudzu root starch. We dig those roots out. We're working from the forest edge because it's a big uh, a, a slope full of kudzu with forests on either side. Um, we're working from the forest edge, and when we dig out a large kudzu root, we plant a chestnut tree in there. And the chestnut tree gets to benefit from that high nitrogen soil, from that loose texture, and begin growing. Then the kudzu vines trellis up the chestnut trees, and kudzu that trellises up trees actually makes better roots because it has more vertical surface from the trellising and because it puts all the energy into one large root instead of multiple small roots. Um, it's also better for basketry because it has this nice long um, runs without any side branches. And it's easier to harvest for fodder uh, because it doesn't get all tangled up like it does when it's growing on the ground. So we're actually, the, the chestnut trees act as trellises as we plant them. And we're going to work in towards the center of the kudzu patch gradually converting it into a chestnut polyculture orchard. I'll speak more about that in a second as we go. So in the short term, we get kudzu 
root starch as a yield. We get the vines for baskets. We get the leaves for fodder. In the midterm, we get chestnuts from the chestnut trees as they begin to mature. In the long term, we get not just the chestnuts, but also blueberries and strawberries that were growing in amongst them. Um, and then long term, uh, high value rot resistant chestnut timber as we actually harvest trees in the long term. So this is how we're turning this into a chestnut-based food forest. And that goes along with kind of the native ecosystem patterns because before the chestnut blight came in, in the 1920s from Asia and killed most of the American chestnuts, south-facing slopes throughout the eastern coast were covered in primarily chestnut trees. So you might say, this sounds like a lot of work. And it is a lot of work because we're doing all of it by hand, most kudzu is planted on steep slopes, so it's, you can't get a machine in there, right? But here's the irony about um, what industrial economies describe as, uh, as labor-saving technologies, because another word for labor is jobs. And so we forget about that. And when we, when we try to uh, bring labor down or replace it with machines, what we're actually doing is taking one really elegant life way where people are living land-based lifestyles and we're splitting it up and creating all these problems of industrial pollution and climate change and unemployment, loss of agricultural and cultural heritage. So in, North, in Western North Carolina in 1970, there were 76,000 farming jobs. In 2002, there were 12,000 farming jobs. And according to Advantage West, if we brought back just a third of those farming jobs, unemployment would be eliminated in Western North Carolina. So just to go give a little taster of that and how economy is related to farming. We've moved all of our farming out into the cities, right? So when we have a collection of organisms that live together and support each other, like the kudzu and chestnut that I just described, we call that a guild. Um, and there, there are different kinds of forest farming guilds we can work with. For instance, there are streamside forest gardens which is, you know, you've noticed how a lot of stream sides around here are cleared by farms. They clear them to grow tobacco and to raise cattle alongside the creek. Well, we can grow a stream side forest garden where we re replant mulberries and elderberries and persimmons and pawpaws and sochan, which is a native green that the Cherokees have always grown and eaten that grows in amongst their ducks that eat the slugs off of everything and produce duck eggs and duck meat and stropharia mushrooms, which are an edible mushroom that grow in wood chip beds and actually filter the water out as it flows downhill before it gets to the creek. And this allows farmers to have an economic incentive to reforest their streams because now, now they have marketable yields from that forest garden and it allows them to actually replace pasture and tobacco fields with forests. And then when we, re when we reforest stream side, that, bring back, that brings back the whole aquatic food web of which they're part and also trout and everything else that depends on shady creeks that are cooler temperatures. And then we have the native medicinal forest farm guild, which is north-facing slopes, where a lot of people think you can't grow food on north-facing slopes, but you can grow sugar maples for maple syrup, ginseng, oyster mushrooms, morels. Then we have the hemlock restoration guild. Some of you know about the hemlock woolly adelgid, yeah, which is killing the native hemlock trees here. Well, the hemlock restoration guild, we use the native medicinal reishi mushroom to break down the wood of hemlock trees back into soil and grow other tree species out of that to bring back those forest ecosystems as climate change occurs. This is how forest farming can work. <clears throat> and forest farming itself is basically an example of permaculture. Has anyone heard the word permaculture? All right, great, a few people have. So permaculture is this ethically based design system for creating regenerative human habitats. It's based on ethics of caring for the earth, caring for people, sharing the surplus. And basically what it is, it's principles that we've derived from natural ecosystems that allow us to redesign our lives. And that's agriculture, but also human settlements, energy systems, businesses, even political systems, relationships. It's a design system that allows us to redesign things, imitating nature so they begin to work. And so <coughs> permaculture is this amazing kind of gift that has been brought to us to help imitate natural ecosystems and redesign our economies around it. So this is why we've created, um, what I'm trying to do is actually create economic incentives to bring forest farming into our region. We've created something called the Forest Cuisine Project. The Forest Cuisine Project 
actually helps to market these, I, these foods that come from forest farms. There are all these unfamiliar foods that we haven't heard of. There are chestnuts and mulberries. You talk about eating acorns or pigeons. People don't know what we're talking about. So we have to get the word out there about what the foods look like, right? So we're working with local chefs working with farmers markets to help introduce these foods and bring samples of them into farmers markets. Um, <coughs> we're uh, teaching classes around the foods and how to prepare them. Um, and then there's actually a local market that's opening up that's interested in having a section all based around what we're calling native cuisine. And so these native cuisines, you think about native cuisines, we're in a, a, na a native forest here, that's the native ecosystem type, right? But now there are deserts in the world, too, and grasslands, too. There are all these different cuisine types wherever we go. The, the current agricultural system that we have is very uh, susceptible to all kinds of climate change and uh, pests and disease because it has very low diversity. Well, that's because we've adopted just about 50 food crops across the entire planet that people are growing in all the same, they're growing the same crops all throughout the world, whether they're adapted to the place and the soils and the climate or not. Well, there are these native cuisines we can, we can develop for each place that are based on, on permaculture, where we work with the species that want to grow there. And so what that means is thousands of food species instead of just 50 food species. And so we can have desert cuisines, we can have forest cuisines, we can have coastal cuisines, uh, grassland cuisines, different foods based on those different places. This idea is very exciting to me. Um, and it, it brings back a whole cultural heritage where people can be proud of the places that we come from. Um, and we can actually have an identity that's based in the region that we come from rather than just working in with this homogenous global identity. So another thing that we need to bring this forest economy into light are forest farmers. We call future forest farmers. You remember uh, the Future Farmers of America as a high school organization? Well, we need future forest farmers of America. And what do forest farmers look like? Well, future forest farmers need to be people who have been educated and trained to do this kind of forest farming. Um, and so we've been developing training programs with community colleges uh, around um, all the different skills, design skills and hand skills necessary to go to a piece of land and design it to be ready for forest farming, as well as to go implement it, manage it, harvest the yields, and then process them into usable forms. Um, another, ac an another need for future forest farmers is access to affordable land. This is a huge issue about the, the average age of farmers in Western North Carolina is about 55 years old, which is actually younger than the average age in a lot of other parts of the country. So what that means is that a lot of farms are turning into developments or being lost from farmland as the owners age. At the same time, a lot of young people don't have access to land. So what we need to do is match up the people who have the land with the people who are going to be the forest farmers moving out to the land. So we're starting a dating service. We're calling it a dating service at the Organic Growers School uh, next year in March between landowners and future forest farmers, young future forest farmers, to help them match up and meet each other. Yeah. Because we don't want that land to go into development. We want it to you know, go into succession, what we call eco ecological succession or cultural succession. So what's this concept of succession? Has anyone heard of ecological succession? What it is, is you know how when a, when a, when a forest is first clear cut, what happens is there's erosion and all kinds of diversity is lost. And then what comes back into that clear cut are what we call pioneer plants. Pioneer plants are those that are competitive. There tends to be lower diversity. They basically horizontally expand to take over territory um, and block everyone out. It's not about cooperation, but more about competition. That's what a pioneer ecosystem is. In a lot of ways, the entire industrial economy has been a pioneer culture, pioneer economy that works by spreading out over the face of the earth and taking over different places in order to extract their resources. And what I want instead is kind of a cultural forest, uh, a, col a, a, a forest economy that's more based on what happens in a mature forest, which is interrelationships between organisms, more cooperation than competition, and more diversity, instead of just everyone trying to horizontally expand and take over all the resources. So that's what I believe this is, is this is a strategy for getting to a cultural forest, to a forest economy, to something where we have an economy that's based 
in the land here where we work with the plants, animals, fungi here and develop an economic base that feeds back in to this place. So by the way, we have a two and a half billion dollar food economy in Western North Carolina. How much of that stays here? One percent. Ninety nine percent of that money that's spent goes outside of our region. Those are tremendous lost opportunities. It's similar for energy. And that's another point I want to make about forest agriculture is that it's not just providing food. So from a forest, you also get medicine, you get building materials, you get fiber, you can even get biomass to produce electricity using pyrolysis, which is a, a, a carbon negative form of electrical production that leaves charcoal behind as an, agriculture, as, as an agricultural amendment for growing foods with. So a forest economy is not even just the foods. The energy economy in Western North Carolina is about $3 billion, and almost none of that stays here because it goes to large centralized ener energy production conglomerates, which are, of course, using coal and nuclear energy, mountaintop removal, coal mining to create the electricity for us instead. So that's what a forest economy is. It doesn't just provide food, but it does provide food. It provides medicines, building materials, clothing, energy production, of course, habitat, and all the ecological benefits of having forest instead of cleared land. So I invite you to think about the strategies that I've described that we're beginning here um, to get forest economy going, to, to get future forest farmers trained, imaginative landowners on board who are willing to open up their land for this kind of use. We need nurseries developing cultivars of the species that we're going to be growing labs testing the medicinal and nutritional components of the foods. I invite you to think about these things and apply them, of course, to other regions in the world because that's where this is going. And I think it's a primary strategy for our cultural and ecological survival in the coming century. Thank you. <laughs>